Thank you. All right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, this evening, we're going to have a roundtable discussion uh, of advanced practice nurses. They're going to share a, bit, a little bit about their journey uh, to becoming ATRNs. So the objectives of this meeting was to facilitate open communication for healthcare workers who are curious about a career uh, in advanced practice nursing, as well as to share uh, educational and practice experience uh, with those that may also be interested in this career path. Also, wanted the opportunity to foster some educational growth uh, within uh, healthcare workers, particularly nursing, um, and offer shadowing opportunities, mentoring, and if someone is um, very close to entering an APRN program or is uh, preceptor opportunities as well. So I have you all here, <laughs> captives to be preceptors. So uh, step one to becoming an APRN, of course, is to start off with becoming a registered nurse. Uh, just for those who may not know, um, you have two entry levels to practice. You have the associate's degree uh, in nursing as well as a bachelor's degree. The associate's degree is typically obtained at a community college. There are a few diploma programs out there, but um, to become an APRN, you do have to have a, a, a bachelor's of nursing. Um, so a diploma program is a lot of extra work. And Katie White actually did a diploma program, did he? Yeah. So um, uh, both entry levels, regardless of the degree, we have to take the NCLEX examination. And we are licensed by our state board. And our state is uh, one of the the compact state, uh, which I have on another slide. And of course, there's RN to DSN programs uh, as well. Um, this is the uh, map of the com uh, compact states. As you can see, there's 31 states that you, we have reciprocity across state lines as nurses. Um, the ones in green have pending legislation. Um, and uh, Gray currently has no action. However, because of COVID, you can pretty much get a job anywhere right now. Step two is to gain experience in your field. If you would desire to be an APRN as an RN, usually you need at least one to five years of clinical experience um, to give you the strong foundation that is necessary um, to apply uh, to an APRN program and to be able to be proficient in that area. Um, one, one thing you can do in getting experience is to join a professional organization. I highly encourage you to join the ANA or the North Carolina Nurses Association. Even as an RN, if you desire to become an APRN, you can join like the American Academy of Nurse Practitioners or the AACN as an RN. Uh, that way you can become aware of the issues that are affecting advanced practice. Um, it helps keep you up to date on guidelines. It can really get you a step up in your education. Um, of course, as an RN, you can uh, get a specialty uh, certification in a variety of fields. Um, typically, this also has a required amount of years of experience, but this can be in med search nursing, progressive care, critical care. Um, the sky's kind of the limit. There's even uh, a medical cannabis nurse certification, so it's all over what you can uh, get certified in. Um, also, you can become active in your state nursing uh, committees or regions. This is a way you can stay on top of what's going on with uh, nursing as well as um, advanced practice nursing. All of these things look great when it comes to applying to graduate school. Every one of these things are helpful to stay on top of uh, your profession, but also in applying for the next step. And um, so step three is you're now the RN, you have a BSN, and I will, uh, there's the caveat here, I would recommend uh, going into a program that does give you a BSN, the ADN to MSN program, I've heard uh, you may not actually receive a BSN. Um, that really boxes you in when you don't have a bachelor's degree to just a nursing uh, field. So I highly encourage a program that does it in increments that so you at least uh, have the BSN, you have the MSN, and you have the actual degree. 
But um, when it comes to going to grad school, most of us had to take a GRE, uh, which is uh, like an aptitude examination for grad students. I uh, highly encourage you to get the book to study it, to brush up on your Latin. If you know Greek words, you can do fine on the GRE. Um, but MSM has four different pathways. You can go uh, through the midwifery, um, nurse anesthetist, uh, the nurse practitioner programs, which have several different pathways within themselves, and then a clinical nurse specialist role. So. There's the ADN to MSN, which is uh, quite a chunk of time. The BSN to MSN is usually about two years. Um, and the MSN to DNP is usually an additional two years. Um, Dr. Nelson that's with us tonight, she actually did the BSN to DNP program, which is a huge chunk of time. And she can definitely speak to some details on that. So your NT pathways are family, adult GERO, and you can do acute or primary care, uh, psychiatric, neonatology. There's also some states that recognize um, pediatrics as well as emergency. Um, and then you can get certifications on top of that as well. So your terminal degrees for APRN, what's the difference in the two? So your PhD is your actual philosophy in nursing. Again, it's a terminal degree. It's rooted in research and is intended for individuals that wish to work as either a nurse educator or a nurse researcher. It is very much focused on the creation of research. These are the creators of research. They are the innovators for nursing. Whereas the DNT, is a program that's rooted in clinical practice and is intended for APRNs. Um, it is focused heavily on clinical practice. You kind of pick a pathway and go with it. Um, but also, it's the application of research. So we, as DNTs, are the maximizers, so to speak. We take what is produced by PhDs and apply it to actual clinical practice. Um, so step four in your journey, you would achieve certification. Um, your most common boards are the first three. Um, and uh, once you are certified, it will uh, communicate with your uh, board of nursing. So once you are an APRN, that's not the end of the road. You have to uh, grow as a professional. Um, consider future specialization and certification. We have a couple of specialties uh, here tonight. We have oncology as well as cardiology that's here. Um, the professional organizations can actually um, do additional certification examples or like critical care or heart failure. Um, get involved with uh, committee work. And this is a huge thing that uh, new graduates need to understand is you have a very unique perspective. You are bilingual. You speak nursing and you speak provider. You are a great liaison between the two worlds, especially on committees that are doing heavy work um, or root cause analysis. You have a perspective that a provider that uh, medicine may not have and also that nursing doesn't have. And your opinion is important and your perspective is quite important. So please get involved with committee work and do not be intimidated by this. Additionally, um, get involved with your organization. Also continue to work on a regional, state, or national level with nursing uh, within the nursing community. Um, I'm going to emphasize again medical staff opportunities. If you're associated with an organization that has medical staff, you are part of medical staff as an MT or a CRNA or a nurse midwife. You are now part of medical staff and your perspective is a little different. Um, I know 10, 12 years ago, me sitting in a medical staff meeting, I stuck out like a sore thumb. I felt awkward. I wasn't amongst my people, so to speak. However, with visibility has become normalcy. And if I'm not in a medical staff meeting, then we're missed. Um, so uh, don't let that be an intimidating thing. Also volunteer uh, for your community. And if you do get a terminal degree, it is your it is your obligation to your um, profession to be a preceptor. Share the knowledge that's been shared with you. 
So um, think about, is this right for me? Um, I know, um, especially as nursing students that are listening to this, this is still so far down the road. But would being an APR, uh, APRN uh, career path be the right thing for me? So think about it in four different ways. Are you up for the intellectual challenge? It's very intense uh, education. It is combined in a short amount of time, and you will read until you're sick of reading. Are you up for that? Also, this is a continuing career-long education, and I don't mean this as just CNE, but you're going to have to stay on top of the newest policies. You have to stay on top of the newest guidelines and uh, constantly uh, refresh your memory about things that you learned in school but you don't do every day. And uh, every once in a while, you're going to come across something that you've never even heard of before. Are you up to uh, reading about this? Also, how much do you value autonomy? If you're currently at the bedside as a nurse and the thought of doing anything autonomously seems completely overwhelming, then that might not be um, the direction you would want to go in. You have to value autonomy. And of course, autonomy is also um, set in your practice environment. Um, if you do primary care, you're going to be more autonomous than somebody that works with a specialty group. Um, and also, regions uh, do affect the autonomy, especially of nurse practitioners. Um, I know you see RNAs are a little bit different, and the midwives are a little different as well. Um, also, before proceeding, um, think about is there ample opportunity for what I want to do? Um, is there market availability? Uh, what I mean by this is, let's say you have a background in pediatrics and you would love to be a pediatric clinical nurse specialist. That's what you've always wanted to do. Well, if you live in a rural area 100 miles away from the closest children's hospital, that's probably not going to be ideal for you um, unless you're willing to relocate. Um, also, there is issues in urban areas with market saturation. It becomes extremely competitive when you have universities that are turning out numerous F and Ps in an area that's desirable to live. So you may have market saturation in your certain area. Of course, in the South rural areas where uh, you can do primary care, you got a job. Um, and also, is there going to be a return on my investment? The cost of education is has to be factored into going back to school. Um, and it's not just tuition. The hidden costs are what cost the most uh, for education. It is the transportation, it is the child care, it is the new tablet you need for clinical, it is that new app that you bought that has all the latest, greatest guidelines on it. That nickel and dime stuff is what eats you up in uh, school, and often you don't budget for that. So um, just an example about the autonomy part of it, NP practice, uh, again, CRNAs work in a whole different world and scope. Um, but this is the latest map that shows the green states have full practice. Um, and you graduate, you take your board, you're, uh, you're licensed by the state, and you're an autonomous provider. Um, you can work independently, you can open up shop as your own clinic, and uh, you're good to go. The states in yellow have a reduced practice, meaning there's a small amount of their practice that's still attached to medicine, whether it's you have to work, uh, you have to be supervised for five years and then you're on your own. Um, but it is a reduced practice in those states. Uh, North Carolina belongs in the red states. That is the most restrictive practice. Um, you cannot practice as an NP in the state without having a collaborating uh, physician. Um, we are regulated by uh, a joint subcommittee that includes the Board of Medicine and the Board of Nursing that regulates our practice. So, return on your investment. So, this information comes from, um, I can move it out of the way for the people in here, but this uh, comes from the American Academy of Nurse Practitioners. Every couple of years, they publish this massive survey that they take. Um, of salaries. As you can see, the money makers are the CRNAs, um, and that is the salary range, and you're going to see how it varies by region. <laughs> then we're all going to leave here and become CRNA. Um, and then um, at the bottom, of course, is your clinical nurse specialist. 
The reason for the lower salary there is many states do not give them any prescriptive authority where some states give them a limited prescriptive authority where they can write for, like if they are diabetes managers or wound care, they can write orders for that. Um, but um, uh, they have pretty limited practice. Of this, I was most interested in the midwives. Um, the certified nurse midwives, um, for, given the level of um, malpractice they have to deal with, that's pretty, um, that was a surprising salary. Um, in the NP world, your psych NPs have absolutely stepped up to take the vacuum that mental health has left, um, and they are being compensated for that. Um, they really have. Your practice setting is pretty straightforward. The sicker the patient, the higher, um, the higher the acuity, usually the higher pay. Um, if you go, regardless of your degree or certification, if you end up in emergency, you're looking at higher money um, than primary care. Um, so this is degree by degree and region. As you can see, MSN, um, that salary. You are compensated a little more overall for your DNT, supposed to be. Um, <laughs> that was some giggles. Um, your PhD I found quite interesting um, because if you talk to anybody in education, they would say there's no way that's correct. So I assume what inflated that was your amount of researchers that uh, contributed to the survey. Um, by state, of course, the West Coast is where you're going to make the most uh, income. Uh, the lowest income would be in Appalachia, in Kentucky, West Virginia, um, which is unfortunately the area of greatest need. Um, from a CRNA perspective, uh, Wyoming, don't know what's going on in Wyoming, but you can make some serious money there. Um, and then uh, Arizona would be the lowest paid. And again, this was two, this was in the last two years and it could evolve significantly based off the demand. And it's gonna be interesting to see how COVID affects these numbers too in two years. So um, cost of education, this is very rough, but I'm just throwing it out there. Um, one, the reason I put this out there is specifically to see how much the entry level BSN is the highest paid degree. So you're paying for the university experience there. Whereas if you do it in steps, ADN, and work your way up from there, it looks more cost effective overall. So our first speaker tonight will be Dr. Nelson. I'm going to tell a little bit about herself and then we're going to go from there. Hi, so I'm Allison Nelson. I'm a nurse practitioner, family nurse practitioner at Girls Talk and Gynecology. I started out at ECU and I got my bachelor's degree there, graduated in December of 2013. Um, I started out, I tried to come here first. <laughs> there were not very many new grad positions. I just like actually ended up at a nursing home, which was a pretty cool experience, a different side of it that I would never have gotten to see before. Um, that's actually where I started my graduate program. I knew when I went into nursing school that I wanted to go straight back into nurse practitioner. I mean, that's kind of why I did nursing in the first place. Um, so I looked a lot into the ECU program while I was there. I talked to a lot of people. So uh, after I worked for a year, I had to do a prerequisite, and then I went straight into the, or applied, went straight into the program. Um, this, I was in the second cohort to graduate, I believe, from the DNP program, so it's still fairly new. It was the only way to get your MP at ECU at the time. I don't know if they've changed it again since then, um, but they had just combined it. So they were still working out some kinks. They've made a lot of changes from what I hear to a lot of changes while we were in the program. Um, during that, I went to, well, after I started the program, I started here. So I worked here for two years on PT. So I met a lot of these people here. Um, had a good time. It was a great experience. A completely different side, obviously, than the nurse. And it was good to have both of those. So I definitely recommend anybody going into a nurse practitioner program to have, if you can have a variety or have some type of intermediate care, intensive care, you want that kind of background to so you can see what you're sending your patients to when they're going to the hospital or just knowing more about the different sides of it. Um, 
when I started the nurse practitioner program, I thought I wanted to work in pediatrics. I did pediatric clinicals and it was fine, but it was definitely not what I wanted to go into. So my other thing is keep an open mind whenever you go into your clinical. Um, I ended up in women's health. Again, I didn't like labor and delivery, so I never thought I would end up in women's health, but we do GYN and it's a lot of primary care. We don't actually do OB, um, except for the first trimester. So just keep it over mind if you do go into things. Don't go in thinking you're going to do one thing. Uh, again, it's why it's good, especially in a rural area, to have that wide range for nurse practitioner, family nurse practitioner, or adult gerontology. So you have a lot of options. They're not tied into one place. Um, so I did the DMT program full time, which was three years. Uh, well, three, yeah, three years and a like a semester. Um, it was a really large focus. EC really pushes the DMP side of it, so it was a huge focus on uh, the doctorate part of it. Uh, my project was on, I was actually in a pediatric clinic at the time, and so it was about flu shots. So children between up to age eight, if it's their first time getting a flu shot, they needed two flu shots. So we worked on getting those kids back um, for that second flu shot. We implemented a text message reminder, so it was a lot of statistics and checking in and just a lot of a lot a lot of time. So just be ready for that. Um, in the end of everything was worth it. So it was a long and short three years and it was it was a really good experience. EC was a great program to go through. It's like a big family there. The teachers are amazing and just the clinical sites were great. I stayed pretty local for clinical sites. Um, I did some um, and some urgent care. I did a pediatric clinic. I actually fell in love with women's health at a health department, which I never thought that that would happen. But I had some amazing, um, I had some amazing preceptors there. So, like Michael said, precepting is huge. And given that experience to people coming up, this teacher already actually had a student with me, one of my friends, um, and she just finished just her nurse practitioner program. So, when you get out and get your feet under you, <laughs> it's nice to go ahead and give that back. Um, I'm credentialed through ANCC, and honestly, that's all I have to say. What were the questions you had, Michael? Um, so these were submitted um, online. What drew you to your respective practice environment, and was it your preferred choice or based on availability of jobs? Yeah, so actually it was my preferred choice, and I waited out for it. So, yeah, I graduated July of 18, and I started at Girl Talk in December. And Florence did not help my job career, <laughs> getting set up and everything. I actually had an interview at a pain clinic at the same time, and it was it was going to be between the two. Thank goodness it worked out like it was supposed to, and I ended up where I wanted to be. But I really did wait out for it. Um, and it's because I knew I wanted to go into women's health. So, and there was one. The other question is, why did you choose your mode of education? Okay, so mine was all, ECU is a distance program. Um, you do go four days a uh, semester and do intensive, so you meet in class, you do skills. We actually had, for your health assessment, you go to the school, they have real people who are trained to teach you how to do health assessments, including male and female assessments. Um, so that's how we did that part of it. Not all online programs have that. They don't have that where you can go in, practice on people. Um, but you know, you get infused in the volunteer video and turn it in. So all programs are different. So I really like that I went in, met people, talked to people, had that face-to-face -face interaction. So I would highly recommend that, at least having somewhere you can go, physically go in and have that resource close by. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And if any of you guys listening remotely have questions, you can submit them either by voice or chat at the end and we'll address them as well. And, oh. yeah. You're already sharing. Yeah, I'm 
Is it behind there somewhere? There you go. Oh, look at you. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. And next up is Ms. Michelle Phillips. <coughs> Hey everybody, I am Michelle Phillips. Um, I have been a nurse practitioner for almost two years now. Um, I started out my education at East Carolina and got my BS in there. Loved it, had a great experience there. Um, I really loved being a nurse. And so I loved every nursing job I had. Um, they were all really different, but as you can see from the PowerPoint, I wanted to try a little bit of everything. Um, I knew the whole time I wanted to be a nurse practitioner, um, but I kept finding nursing jobs that I really loved. I didn't want to leave. <laughs> um, so even, I mean, I did teach ICU. I thought that was my favorite. My next job I did, I was a clinical care manager for a home health company. That was really interesting. But that was cool because I could teach those folks how to take care of my patients the way they were not. Um, so that was cool, and then I worked at Girl Talk as a nurse for a while, where Allison is now. Um, then I actually did private duty nursing for a year. I like that so much. I kept doing it after I graduated school for a little while. Um, when I finally went back to school, I chose UNC Wilmington MSN program. It was really important to me to have somewhere to go. Um, again, I didn't want to leave my job, so I did a program. It was full-time, but I also worked full-time. If you think you want to do that, good luck. It's really hard. Um, you'll probably lose some weight. <laughs> but anyway, it is eventually. Um, I would say, though, seriously, if you are doing a full-time online program, you need to dedicate, I'd say, at least minimum 20 hours a week um, planning to do your schoolwork, your study, and your reading. It's a lot. So if you're working 40 hours a week, 20 hours a week studying, you have to sleep sometimes. So, Really consider that when you are choosing your program. Um, UNC Wilmington was a good fit for me because I was living in Moorhead at the time, so it was drivable. Um, first, each semester we went a little less and we went on campus for intensive. Um, but that first year we had to go, I think we went every month. And I really appreciated that because it is very overwhelming at the beginning. So if you're somebody that chooses a program that's all online and you're not going to a site, I would recommend um, reaching out to the folks in your program that you can talk to um, because it's hard to go through by yourself <laughs> if you don't have some colleagues that really lay on there. Um, I chose to, when I graduated school, um, again, I was happy with my nursing job. So I wasn't in a hurry to start my nurse practitioner career. I was happy. Um, so I waited until the right thing came along. I've been a nurse in women's health for a while, and I really enjoyed it. But I, in my clinical, during nurse practitioner school, I really enjoyed taking care of men. Um, so I wanted to be somewhere where I could do either family practice or internal medicine. So I ended up at Carter at Medical Group. It's been a really good fit. I really enjoyed it. Um, career goals. <laughs> the first couple of years are pretty tough as a nurse practitioner, at least in an internal medicine clinic. Um, it has tested me a lot, and I've learned so, so much. Um, I would recommend as a nurse practitioner, in North Carolina, we still have supervisor positions. So before you accept your position, find out who your supervisor position is. You want it to be somebody you can talk to, you're not relying on them all the time, but somebody you feel comfortable with, bouncing ideas back and forth. Um, words of wisdom, I would say really enjoy your time as a nurse before you jump right back into going back to school. I, after being a nurse for like one or two years, I applied to nurse practitioner school, interviewed at Duke, thought about it, prayed about it. I am so glad I didn't do it. I did not have enough experience. I wouldn't have been lost. Um, so just take your time as a nurse. Grow there for a while. Don't be in a hurry to be a nurse practitioner. It will be there if it's meant to be there. Um, <laughs> words of wisdom, I learned a lot in school, learned a whole lot in my clinical rotation. If you can set up your own clinical rotation, it's hard, um, but you will know what kind of environment you're going to be in. I did all my rotations here at local practice, so that was really helpful too when applying for jobs. I knew what to expect in our community. So that's something that takes a little bit of extra time to work, but definitely do that yourself. Um, and definitely take a review course before your board test. That was really good, and I actually still use that book as a reference 
for the things I don't see as much. Um, so that was really good. The rest of the advice on there is just stuff I've learned in the first year and a half, and you can read that later. Um, but yeah, if y'all have any questions you need to get in touch with me, I think my email is on the hospital website. I'm glad to answer any questions you've got. Um, and I kind of already addressed this, but the questions that Michael received, I chose my mode of education because I did not want to leave my job. So that's why I did the online thing, and I still want to have a place where I could go. And then I chose the way um, for my specialty field because I, I wasn't afraid. Thank you so much. Next up, we have uh, Katie White. Hey, everyone. My name is Katie White. Um, so I started out my nursing education in a diploma program, which there aren't very many of those anymore. Now I think they're mostly associate degree. I did my bachelor's online, and it was like a half-time program because um, I had to work full-time while doing it. Um, and then as far as nursing goes, my first job was inpatient hematology oncology, which was probably one of the best experiences. Patients were super sick. Our ratios were high. We had eight patients to one nurse. Um, but I got a lot of really good experience um, with chronic conditions. And then all of our patients were deeply ill with getting chemo and stuff. Um, I did some travel nursing out in California after that. Did med surge, tele, ortho, and then I actually worked on the AIDS unit at San Francisco General, which was another really good experience. Um, and then ended up here, and most of the time I was on PCU, left again to go to California, and then came back again. So <laughs> eventually, after moving cross country and back a couple of times, I decided to finally go back to school um, for my NP. I knew I always wanted to be a nurse practitioner, but I just kept finding reasons to keep putting it off and then moving a few times and changing the areas of work. Um, so then I finally went back to school. My program was actually 100% online, which I felt like was a good fit for me. I was really comfortable with my clinical skills and my decision-making skills as a nurse. Um, so I felt like that contributed a lot to my education. I liked the fact that I could choose my own clinical site, so I did all of my clinical sites locally. Um, I was with all nurse practitioners just so I could get a good perspective of what they do and how they make decisions, um, and also how they communicate with their collaborating physician because that was something that I didn't fully understand until I went to school. Um, my specialty or my focus for my NP program was adult and gerontology primary care. I love the Medicare age population. Everybody that knows me pretty much knows that I, those are my people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, with my dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that allowed me to just kind of focus on that specific patient population. Never had any interest in pediatrics, still don't. Never had any interest in women's health, still don't. So. I'm not missing out on that. <laughs> so my position now, technically it's called Medical Optimization Nurse Practitioner. So it was a brand new position at the hospital. So that kind of drew me to it because I could build it from the ground up. I could make it whatever I want it to be. I'm a total control freak. I love autonomy. I don't like to be micromanaged. Um, so it's been an interesting experience. I had absolutely no OR experience, so everybody's kind of been really good to me going into this foreign environment. So I definitely left my comfort zone. Um, but I see patients in day surgery and pre-op. Um, the majority are outpatients, and I see them on an as-needed basis. My job is to basically make sure that all of their chronic conditions, their CHF, their COPD, their hypertension, their diabetes, are as good as they can be. So that's different for every single patient. Um, and then kind of trying to meld the two, like a primary care perspective and then what anesthesia would want and kind of what we need to be concerned about with the surgery and what type of anesthesia and how long they're going to be under and the blood loss and some of their different medications and 
I'm learning every single day. Um, the one thing that saved me was the hospital sent me to a Mayo Clinic conference when I first started in October, and it was like a two and a half day conference. They called it like a pre-op boot camp. Um, and that was like a good base for me to start my job. I was able to network with a lot of other people that did my same job because the specialty is still pretty new. There's no special certification for it or anything. And it was interesting to see that everybody does it a little bit different. Um, so, but I still keep in touch with all of those people. And I met a lot of people at New Hanover. They have their own freestanding pre-op clinic. Um, so networking with all of them. Oh, career goals. Um, I'm still overwhelmed <laughs> in my job. So that's to come. Right now I'm just focused on my job and trying to make sure that you stay up with the guidelines and the different recommendations and trying to go between cardiology and primary care and then sometimes endocrinology and a lot of pulmonology and just trying to figure out what the best thing is for the patient. Um, I'm kind of the middle person right now that goes between the patient and anesthesia and surgery and then the specialty. Um, so it's hard to please everybody at the same time. Um, and then words of wisdom. I would say don't put off going back to school. I put it off for literally 10 years. So after I finally finished and realized that I could have done it, I wish I would have done it a long time ago. I kept putting it off because I kept moving back and forth. And I really could have done it while moving. Um, my program, it was half time. I worked full time. Towards the end, I did drop down to part time uh, because it was just too much with all of the clinical hours and the extra requirements. Um, so I did drop down to part time and then I could just pick up extra shifts. I don't have kids or anything to worry about. So I think that made my life a lot easier for going back to school. Um, and then if you do decide to go back to school for a nurse practitioner, it's very frustrating, I think, your first year. I'm still my first year in, but I just try to remind myself um, all of the different support I have. I'm constantly texting, calling, messaging other providers in the community. Hey, will you look at this EKG? What do you think of this? Um, and just, you know, asking for their input if I have questions, and then reaching out to the people that I've met across the country, too. So I try to utilize all of my resources before I go to my anesthesia doc and try to like formulate my own plan and kind of answer my own questions first. Um, uh, Katie, what drew your, you to your respective practice environment and was it your preferred choice or based off of availability? Honestly, I just kind of fell into my, <laughs> I fell into my position. So I started out two, it was two part-time positions. I was with Michelle at Carter at Medical Group. Um, and then trying to start this, and I, it just wasn't going to work. So, because I was really trying to devote full-time hours to both jobs, and primary care is hard. I mean, it's hard, and then trying to split, come here in the morning, and then go over there at lunchtime and see patients. I mean, I was having like 14, 15, 16-hour days, and it just wasn't going to, it just wasn't going to stick. So. I just kind of fell into this, and honestly, I love, I absolutely love my job. I hope I can do it forever, because I think it's a good mix. I'm constantly learning every day, like about anesthesia and surgery stuff, and then I still get to focus on the primary care stuff and see patients and educate them and stuff like that, so. Um, what was the question? Oh, okay. Uh, so while we're still hanging out in the OR, um, Timothy Carpenter, he's the chief CRNA here at Carteret, is going to tell us a little bit about himself. All right. My name is uh, Tim Carpenter. I'm the chief CRNA here at uh, Carteret Healthcare. Um, I had kind of a long, torturous journey to get to this point in my career. Um, after high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do, so I actually took a year off from school and worked two jobs, uh, one of which was an industrial laborer at a construction site, which uh, really motivated me to go back to school. 
Um, <laughs> so I began my my education at uh, Pamlico Community College over in Bay River. Um, I went there uh, to get my associates before transferring to East Carolina to finish uh, get my uh, BS in there in 1998. Um, while there, I worked as a nursing assistant on a uh, surgical intermediate unit at Biden. Uh, back then, it was Pitt County Memorial Hospital. I uh, worked there for a year and a half until graduation. Um, upon graduation, I uh, worked as a nurse on the surgical intermediate unit for about a year and a half before I transitioned to the ICU, um, which back then was kind of the normal progression to uh, going to anesthesia school was um, not many people started at least at that level one uh, center there in the ICU right out of school. Um, so I went to there thinking that I would transition to uh, anesthesia school within a few years, uh, turned into 10 years almost. Um, I nearly applied to East Carolina's inaugural class. Um, I went toward the facility with Dr. McAuliffe, and um, my two oldest children were a little small at the time, and so I kind of backed out and put it off, um, waiting for the perfect time. And uh, early words of wisdom, but there is never a perfect time. Just to jump in. Um, so I finally jumped in and graduated uh, from East Carolina in uh, 2012. I stayed on at Biden and worked um, there for two and a half years, really with plans of, of being there for most of my career. I wanted to get back um, to this area. I grew up in Havelock, and this was kind of my retirement plan. Um, but kind of on a whim, a, a job position came open here at, at Carteret Healthcare. I made the move. Uh, I've been here almost six years now. Um, Education-wise, to get here, uh, anesthesia program is a little different from every other advanced practice nursing degree in that there is no online option at all. Um, you are on campus. Um, it's a little intimidating jumping in. I know at East Carolina, we started in January, uh, and the first class we took, we took uh, pharmacology with med students as well as physiology. Um, the pharmacology class that we started in in January was actually the second pharmacology class that the med students had taken. So we had missed half of what they had already learned and jumped in and were expected to uh, hit the ground run. Um, East Carolina is an excellent anesthesia program. Um, they take 12 um, students a year. I think for two years they ballooned up to 14 students a year and they back, back down to 12. Um, you have to have at least one year of critical care uh, practice as a nurse prior to being admitted to any anesthesia school. Um, and it has to be adult critical care. They, most anesthesia schools will not count pediatric. They will not count flight nursing as well um, or ER nursing. Uh, it's got to be adult critical care. Um, Upon graduation, we have to take our board certification to NBCRNA, the uh, National Board for Certifying Registered Nurse Assistants. And then continuing education-wise, we have to, um, there's an eight-year cycle technically split up into two four-year cycles. So we have to do 100 uh, CEUs in the first four-year block. Second-year block, we now have to take an exam um, on top of four core modules, um, really like four core remediation um, classes, the physiology, pharmacology, and then a couple of, of core modules that are uh, specific to anesthesia. Initially, when they brought that up, we were going to have to fulfill the exam. They talked about maybe making a stop practice, but that has been backtracked to if you don't do well, I think there is some remediation, but you do not lose your ability to practice it if you don't do well. They maybe make you retake some modules to focus on the areas that you maybe were to Um There's really no other additional certifications for uh, the RNAs. Um, and although the bulk of our practice is in the hospital setting, there are more, multiple areas, including office-based practice, um, GI clinic practice. Um, I personally chose hospital practice at, at this point just because um, 
getting into uh, office-based practice and GI clinic practice, you hate to use the word monotonous, but it's the same, you know, pushing for quality from our perspective, and, and it's the same thing, and you really lose the variety of stuff that you see, whereas in a hospital setting, even though here at Carteret we don't do quite as much as we did at Biden, but um, um, it is nice to see a variety of patients. Uh, and again, words of wisdom, just uh, it's never too late to jump in. Um, don't wait for the perfect time. Just feel like you want to do it. Go for it. And you answer those questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you much. Um, uh, next is uh, Melanie Patterson. Are, are you on, Melanie? Okay. Tell us all about yourself. All right. Um, so I graduated from Clemson University with my BS in, in 1990. I graduated. I work in a level two trauma center in Anderson, South Carolina, uh, in emergency care. Um, for almost five years. Um, the nurse practitioner program opened up at Clemson and I was living there. It was rather convenient. So another nurse and I who had talked about going back to school sort of looked at each other and said, let's do it. And that's what we did. So we went back to school together. Um, graduated with a family nurse practitioner degree in 1996. And as I Went through school. I uh, worked full time to begin with, and then you know weaned off working full time and uh, started doing my clinicals. Uh, my husband was in grad school at the time as well, so that was a little bit difficult. Um, but uh, graduated in 1996, and I went uh, for a large uh, primary care office, in Carolina. Uh, I have not gotten a, a job here on the coast. I will probably still be in primary care. Um, when I came to the coast in 2001, um, there were not very many nurse practitioners at all. Um, I sent my resume everywhere. And um, at the time in 2000, um, there was not much online or <laughs> you had to kind of find things on in the phone book and just drive by. So I dropped up resumes in lots of different places. Um, and my husband said, well, did you look at the hospital? And I said, well, no, he said, well, you should look. And at the time there was a position to open in oncology. And, um, I said, oh gosh, oncology. I, you know, I can't yuck. <laughs> I don't want to do that. And he said, well, why don't you just apply? You know? So I did. Um, and I was contacted, uh, came back up for an interview and got hired and started in June of 2001. And I've been at the clinic ever since. It changes. Um, when I first came to the clinic, we had, uh, we were working with ECU, um, the physician was, uh, I was uh, did not work out well, and um, and so they hired Dr. Loins back in 2000. The physician and Dr. Loins, um, I basically ran the clinic by myself for about six weeks. Um, I did have backup uh, through ECU, uh, through Darl, uh, Dr. Charlie Canup, who are fantastic. They would come down once a week and see new patients, and otherwise, um, I had the clinic uh, by myself. Um, and then Dr. Loins came, and everything since then has just grown. We've grown and grown and grown. We now have uh, not only Dr. Loins, of course, but we have Dr. Quirpo and our other nurse practitioner, Mark Schuler. Um, it is an absolutely fantastic place to work. Um, everyone works together. Um, we stay very busy. Um, are so grateful and um, 
you know, pretty much all of them. So it's a, it's a very um, interesting place to be. Um, uh, let's see, what have I forgotten? What else? Um, I just try to stay on top of new technology. Treatment, that's all changing. Um, so I am trying to stay on top of that uh, as best I can. Um, and um, I would love to be a mentor for other nurse practitioners who um, aren't as familiar with oncology. It can be uh, a scary thing. Um, but uh, I would love to do work with anybody that wants to do that. Um, certified by the ANCC. And I guess that's it. <laughs> Hello. And Melanie, you pretty much answered all of our Hello. questions. Hello. Um, thank you. You S&Ps are the warriors of this family practice. And um, so unfortunately, uh, Nicole Frost is unable to, to get here tonight. And so um, one of the things I wanted her to address is uh, she, uh, she's an SNP that actually went back to do acute care as well, completed that. She um, was initially in a PhD program, but has transitioned to DNP. And I wanted her to address some of her reasons behind that because she has a background as an educator, but um, you know, people who do are attracted to research are very specific people. <laughs> so I wanted her to be able to address that. So if you have any specific questions related to that, um, Nicole highly approachable, and um, please, um, she said, feel free to contact her, or email her. So next, we're going to have uh, Ms. Regina Newton come speak. My name is Regina Newton. I have medical privileges here at Carter Healthcare, and I'm employed by Carolina East Medical Center. I work with Carolina East Heart Center in Moorhead. Uh, there's two offices, one in Newburn and one in Moorhead. Four cardiologists rotate through the hospital on a weekly basis, and I collaborate with them on a daily basis. We also have two interventional cardiologists that work here as well. I did not intend to become a nurse. I started out, and I have a degree in commercial design with graphic arts. Life happens, things change, and all of a sudden I'm thrown to, what am I going to do now? I have, I'm a single, going to be a single mom with a small child. So I prayed about it, talked with a girlfriend, except Carter Community College tabloid at the time, or their tab. And I looked at recreational therapists, I thought, well, that sounds like fun. And then I looked at respiratory <laughs> therapy, it's not like sputum, and then nursing was a, a very good option as well. And I actually had a great telephone conversation with Taylor Hyman, who was the director of the program at the time, um, and encouraged me to go into the LPN program. One of my very good girlfriends told me to stop playing and start working and encouraged the nursing route. <laughs> so I chose to go to Craven Community College because at the time they had the associate's degree in nursing and that afforded me the opportunity to graduate and um, become licensed as a registered nurse, which is what I did and graduated in 2003. During that time, I thoroughly enjoyed anatomy and physiology. And I was speaking with my instructor and having a discussion regarding continuing my education and my career and pursuing a higher level and um, practice in nursing. And she encouraged either physician assistant or, um, which was not going to be realistic, I could not commute at the time on a daily basis uh, to Greenville for Moorhead City with a small child. And so the next alternative she presented was nurse practitioner, which was actually, it just, it fit. And um, I love the discipline of nursing and everything it offers to our patients and our community. So considering I have a totally unrelated degree and I've, to I've switched now into the left side of my brain, I 
began working at Carter at that time General Hospital in 2003 with the intent to pursue my bachelor's degree and then on to nurse practitioner earning a master's degree. I worked on the, med on the surgical floor uh, for two years and transferred to critical care where I then worked for the remaining eight. Um, completing my bachelor's degree and prior to that all the prerequisites required. So it was basically a 10 year journey, or actually, excuse me, it was a, it's an eight year journey to that point. When I um, interviewed at East Carolina for the MSN program, they offered either family nurse practitioner or adult gerontology concentration. My response to them for the adult gerontology was, I think children should have rosy cheeks and run around, and I prefer the adult population. So I, working full time, um, enrolled in the part time program. It was a three year program, and they told me, which was excellent advice, the first two years I'm able to work full time, third year, absolutely not. So keep that in mind. Um, as you plan your career path and your educational goals, how is this going to fit? Um, so during my uh, clinical rotations, the specifics were gerontology, rotation, primary care or internal medicine, and a semester of specialty care, as well as women's health. My specialty care was the final semester, and I divided it between endocrinology and cardiology. I felt at home with cardiology, and during my last week, I had the opportunity to observe uh, coronary artery bypass grafting surgery. I stood at the head of the table, and as the surgeon operated, answered question after question after question. Little did I know he was interviewing me at the same time. So as I graduated, or when I graduated in 2013 from East Carolina, I studied for boards, passed, thank goodness, and began employment with Carolina East Medical Center in October of 2013. I worked with Carolina, or excuse me, with cardiac thoracic and vascular surgery for two years in the operating room, um, managing our patients pre, peri, and post-operatively as well as follow-up, um, transferred to cardiology when this position became available and absolutely found my calling. I am uh, certified by the American Academy of Nurse Practitioners, my specialty practice environment, cardiology. I have always worked in an acute care setting, and that's where I anticipate I will complete my career is remaining in acute care, but who knows, things change. I'm still in the planning phase for my career goals, I think, because I'm so tired of everything that's going back to school, it's hard for me to even think about that at this point. Um, however, what I would like to see is the development of a heart failure clinic in this county. It is prevalent, it has um, the rehospitalization, the cost, the burden on the healthcare system is exorbitant, and I feel like, um, from a nursing perspective, blending the medical discipline, uh, psychosociology, addressing everything that nursing brings to the table from a holistic approach, that we could help prevent so many hospitalizations and ensure quality of life for these patients who suffer from this chronic illness. Um, the words of wisdom I have are never, ever lose sight that first and foremost, we are, we are nurses, and that is our professional gift to our community, to our patients, and our colleagues as well. Never stop learning, even though I'm in that holding phase. Um, focus on long-term goals. There's a lot, I had a lot of obstacles in my career path, but I kept focused, and day by day, hour by hour, Semester by semester, I achieved them and just stay focused. And also get permission to be kind to yourself. Take time for yourself. It's, um, it's a long journey. It's stressful, strenuous, having good family support, but giving permission 
to take that 20 minute walk or go outside and get away from the computer if you're an online student or even just doing an assignment. It just helps balance his life and keeps you grounded and minimizes the stress. Online um, was the educational path I chose and actually was that was basically chosen for me just with my life situation. So it worked well. Um, with the MSN program, as Allison said, we, I attended East Carolina. Pre-semester, we would go for a day workshop and then on campus for our physical assessment class. Great opportunities. Um, we were exposed to EKGs, steroid injections, and um, physical exam had live patients or models for patients. So it was good hands-on experience as well. Can you answer those questions? Okay. Thank you. Um, now that we are going into the leaving the OR and now into the acute care world, um, Ms. Catherine Smith. Hey guys, uh, I'm Catherine Smith. Some of you may know me as Captain Long. That's a whole story in itself. But anyway, um, <laughs> so and I apologize. I have my work phone because the ER is blowing up. So um, anyway, um, I am a native from Warren City. Moved away for about eight years to figure out who I was and what I wanted to do. Um, I started out wanting to be a physician. I wanted to be a trauma surgeon. Um, and <laughs> Little did I know what that actually meant. Uh, Grace Anatomy was a big thing when I was <laughs> in high school. Uh, Dean Marston lived across the street from me. I talked his ear off about surgery. And between him and one of the only orthopedic surgeons in the county, they're like, you know, you really need to think about what your goals are as you mature in life and where your priorities are going to lie. Um, and I didn't really know what that meant. I, you know, was 18 years old. I was going to Appalachian State University. I was a biology major. I was going to snowboard, and then I was going to be a trauma surgeon. <laughs> and uh, so I took a lot of time to think about what was important to me in life and where I wanted to end up and what my end goal was and if there were more than one path that could lead me to the same end goal. I didn't know what a nurse was. Um, so I didn't even consider becoming a nurse. If I knew what one was prior to wanting to be a trauma surgeon, I think I would have chosen to be a nurse. Um, I come from a family of educators, so I had no real mentorship through my family. So I sought out uh, other people in the community. When I was in high school, I volunteered at the emergency department here at Carteret, slapping patient bands on people and thought it was cool that people were rolling in mangled. Um, so I knew that somewhere in medicine I would end up. Um, at App State, biology, I loved it. I loved science. Um, anatomy and physiology was my jam. Um, but I struggled. I was a really bad student. Physics, chemistry, I didn't understand what was going on. My brain doesn't think that way. So I was like, wow, you know, I, I can't do this. Medicine's not for me. I'm going to go into psychology. And so I sat in a psychology class and fell in love more with human beings, but was bored to tears because the work wasn't challenging enough. So I was like, all right, something's got to give. So I uh, went home after my junior year of, of undergraduate and didn't tell my parents I wasn't going back to school. And when it was time to move back in, there I sat. And so my mom said, you need to figure your life out. And um, through some conversations, was introduced to nursing. And I actually enrolled at Carter Community College I had some prereqs um, that I needed to actually retake, so some of the nursing schools wouldn't accept some of my classes because they were like med school preparatory instead of nursing driven. So I spent a year at CCC, which was nice because I also worked as a CNA um, at a local skilled nursing facility, so I got some um, hands-on experience with patients and absolutely loved it. I loved being there with people. I liked being their their legs when they couldn't walk and their brain when they couldn't think and their voice when they couldn't speak. And I was like, wow, I, I have the strength to take on what somebody else may not have and how can I further this? Um, 
So I applied to, I applied to um, East Carolina, and at the time they were on a point system. And remember the, the sentence about I wasn't a good student? Well, the point system didn't add up for me. So I had to, I had to drop back and punt, and I went to Barton College, um, and I graduated there with my BSN in 2000. And, um, I graduated in 2008? No, I messed up on that. I graduated in 2012. Sorry. It was the tax back. Okay. Yeah, I graduated in 2012. Um, I knew that I wanted to move back home because, as my mentors had once said, identify your priorities and things that you love in life. And I love my family. I love my friends. And I ended up back here because of them. Um, so I started out in the nurse residency program here at the hospital. I thought that was a great transition to practice. I was very well supported in my practice. Started out on progressive care, worked for about six months, and I'm like, you know, there's patients on ventilators that look super sick, that looks fun, and really started asking questions about what is critical care, and um, I found myself in critical care after about eight months on PCU, and I have done most of my career in critical care. Um, I was standing in the room of an intubated patient and thinking to myself, if technology supports a human life like this, there's got to be more. I didn't know about ECMO, I didn't know about CRRT, I didn't know about those things because in small community hospitals, you're just not exposed to it and it's nobody's fault, it just is what it is. So I started looking on the internet, I started typing in critical care and ICU because I wanted to be an ICU nurse. And so I found the Society of Critical Care Medicine, and now critical care medicine is my, it's like my addiction. And I found a class called Fundamentals of Critical Care, um, and it's basically uh, in the first 24 hours, it gives providers and nurses the ability to care for patients that need to be stabilized and then move to tertiary care. So I went to Biden Medical Center, sat with some great minds, um, was taught by their head of trauma, and some of their MICU folks about what critical care is. And we focused on sepsis, that's when sepsis was really starting to become this thing. Um, learned about ventilators and life support and all, all this really cool stuff. And I came back here with a new fire. And so I'm always telling people like, find something that continuously gives you your fire. Um, that helps not only you progress, but your profession progress and the people around you catch the fire, you know, we're only as good as our weakest link. We've got to continue to encourage people to learn and, and make us better. Um, so again, I found myself standing in a room one day and I said, there's got to be more. I'm not doing my patients any service by standing here not learning, so I decided to go back to school. Um, I initially applied to Duke University to their cardiology program and I was waitlisted twice. I got incredibly frustrated and um, just made the decision to go to an online program. At the time, uh, there were not very many acute care programs that were uh, online or even hybrid programs. So I found uh, Maryville University out of St. Louis, Missouri. Um, Katie White, who spoke earlier, she and I, she's one of my very best friends, and we decided to do this thing together. Um, when our paths kind of she went more primary care and I went more acute and critical care. Um, you kind of find yourself alone, but the cool thing the program offered was you could connect with people in your region. So I actually connected with some people from um, parts of Eastern North Carolina and um, we made our own little group and those people really helped me through. There, um, one's a CVICU nurse practitioner and one is a neuro ICU nurse practitioner. So I have my own little uh, Rolodex of people when I get in trouble down in the ER and I can call them. Um, so it was really a cool experience. Um, I did set up my, my uh, rotations and in the back of my head, I knew that I wanted um, intensive care medicine. However, I was incredibly fortunate enough to meet one of my best friends and now mentor, Michael Kennedy, um, who allowed me the opportunity to fall in love with hospitalist medicine. I, my eyes were opened. It's, it's kind of like the diamond in the rough. Uh, uh, you know, they're not really especially, I guess, but um, it's a really cool part of medicine. I, uh, I'm kind of like a squirrel. Like, I'm like, ooh, ooh, ooh. So 
there's, you know, there's something new every single day. I'm completely challenged. I'm not challenged. Hold on a second. That was wrong. Um, <laughs> I'm intellectually challenged <laughs> by the patience that come in every single day. And uh, so it's, it's a great, um, a great first job. And the reason I chose Carter Healthcare and the hospitalist uh, role is because I knew that I would get an awesome foundation with people that care about me. I've, I've been here since 2012, and I knew that I would be fostered and nurtured and, and all those things a new graduate needs, um, and I couldn't be more pleased. I currently work with the hospitalist service as an admitter. I work uh, a 10-hour shift, 2 p.m. to midnight. Um, my program did not offer intensive, so I didn't get to go and do hands-on stuff, so I found my own. I went to uh, Chicago and did an uh, invasive lines and invasive procedures class. It was two days, intubations, lines, all those things. Um, and I have a cool position here where I not only admit patients, but I can pick up some rounding as well. Um, and then I do a lot of the invasive procedures um, for the hospitalist service. Um, being like central lines and, and arterial lines and that sort of thing. Um, uh, my additional certifications, I have my critical care registered nurse and then my fundamentals of critical care as well. And then I um, continue to build a solid foundation within my hospitalist team and ultimately I really still like to get an intensive care. Um, I, I love it. I was fortunate enough to rotate through a MICU during my rotations at a neighboring hospital and absolutely loved it. Um, I did some hospitalist work here, and then I worked in or rotated in CBICU up at um, Carolina East and know that I never want to do that. So um, <laughs> my words of wisdom is push yourself outside of any comfort levels you have. Do not be afraid of your own potential. I hid in my own shadow for years and let other people dictate my life. Um, break out of your shell. Find people that love you and care about you. and. Um, and people you can bounce ideas off of. And if you've got a goal, do it. You know, um, when I first started as a nurse here, there, there weren't very many nurse practitioners, and then they all packed up and rolled for multiple reasons. And I'm like, well, I'll never have a job. And then I was like, well, who cares? I'll, I'll do it, and I'll figure it out. And just make your own way. Nurse practitioners are, and, and CRNAs, the advanced practice RNs and that sort of thing, we're strong people. We're doing this. We're pushing some odds. So. Get out there and do it. So if you guys have any questions, um, please don't hesitate. Thanks. Okay. Well, after that, this is going to be pretty anticlimactic. <laughs> Not nearly as passionate. Thank you, Catherine. All right. So um, as you, I'm Michael Kennedy. So my entry level uh, to nursing uh, was an ADN program. I went to Lenore Community College, graduated in 2002. I was a baby nurse. Cannot believe you can give a 20-year-old that much power uh, to be an RN. Um, and interestingly enough, I didn't want to do nursing. I had uh, no desire necessarily to do anything in medicine. I was about to graduate high school, lived in the middle of nowhere, wanted to get out of there, and I said, let me look at all my options. So I applied to a truck driving program, I applied to cosmetology school, applied to nursing school, and me and a friend that I went to high school with both got accepted and was like, let's do this. So we did. Um, and I later went back to do my BSN at Barton in 2008. My background in nursing was uh, critical care, renal nephrology, uh, gastroenterology. Um, interestingly enough, um, back when um, I was an RN, we had scribes in the hospital. They were called clinicians or scribes, and I had the opportunity to work with Eastern Nephrology as a scribe uh, in uh, Lenore Memorial in Kempton, and so I would see these acute patients, uh, let the nephrologist know what's going on, see them with the nephrologist, and then I would dictate their notes. There is no better way to learn anything than to be a scribe. It was an awesome opportunity. It's like having a fellowship in nephrology. And then I did the same thing with GI as well. Uh, those scribe jobs are hard to find, but if you find it, doesn't matter what it pays, quit your job if you want to be a APRN and get that scribe job. Uh, ER docs, you'll use them a lot in a lot of areas, but that is probably the best thing to help you get a leg up as an APRN. 
Uh, the graduate school, for somebody who really doesn't uh, care about nursing, <laughs> I've spent a lot of time in uh, nursing school, so to speak. Um, I got my A&T. Uh, at the time, I went to ECU um, as an adult nurse practitioner was the program that was all, uh, offered at the time. I know it's now adult GERO. Um, and it was a hybrid course um, at that point in time. We had to spend a certain amount of hours on campus, a certain amount of hours at distance. Um, then uh, once I completed the program, I got this wild idea that I might want to do management at some point. So I completed their uh, uh, postmasters in leadership and management and focused on acute care and public health. A semester in, I realized I never want to be anyone's boss and I never want to be responsible for anybody's budget. Um, however, I pointed that out because there is no education that is useless. Uh, even though I've never had a job with that, that used that degree, I'm able to sit in committee meetings and I can follow the verbiage. I can sit in on finance meetings and be able to read a capital budget plan. Um, so it gives me some working knowledge of costs and how things operate and uh, have great respect for anybody in administration because I can't do it. The only thing that keeps me together is hairspray half the time. So um, because uh, I immediately after I graduated uh, with my adult MP, I stayed in acute care. So um, I did inpatient GI and then I uh, went to work with a hospital of service down in Onslow um, and worked there for eight years. Um, while I was doing um, hospitalist work, I realized that S&Ps and A&Ps were going to get pushed out of this world eventually and I don't know how to do anything else but work in a hospital. So I completed an adult GERO acute care program. Um, uh, at Duke University. Um, because I went back later, this was uh, distance-based, but we had to go to campus, uh, campus a certain amount of days out of each semester. Um, that was a really good experience, um, uh, and they pretty much put you through critical care rotations the entire time, like I rotated through ICUs. Uh, trauma, realized I never, ever want to do that. Uh, that you never want to do that either, um, and the ICU and NICU and so forth. Um, so, of course, I wanted to complete my DNT. I did that through ECU. I focused on acute care. I did my project on um, uh, evidence based risk stratification of adults who present with chest pain in rural communities. That's a lot of work to say. I spent three years talking about nothing but chest pain day and night. I completed that program while I simultaneously completed the adult GERO program at Duke, so I have no sympathy for anybody else's four time management. <laughs> um, and I worked full time as a hospital, that's why I did it. Um, I had four days off the year 2015, so. Um, and then later completed a nursing education degree from ECU, certified by the AEMP and the AACC. Uh, practice environment currently employed with the hospital service here at Carteret and per diem at Biden. Um, additional certifications are in critical care, medical cardiology, and as well as heart failure. Please obtain certifications and things you use every day. As Regina pointed out, you will do heart failure all day every day if that's what you do if you work with a hospital or service. Cardiology is a huge part of your day, and even if you don't enjoy cardiology, you need to know as much as you can about it. So career goals, I want to stay in acute care, it's all I know, I really don't want to do anything else. Um, I like teaching clinically um, and seek out every opportunity I can. I take med students, I take acute care NP students. Um, I would love to be part of acute care NP residency program. The one that we did have in the state has been put on hold for a while. That would be amazing, especially in a rural community. And words of wisdom that I have, I use this all the time. It's a quote by Randy Posh who wrote the last lecture. And if you um, want to continue in healthcare, please read that book. It's amazing. Uh, it's a man who wrote a book about living the whole time he was dying. And it's experience is what you get when you didn't get what you wanted. Everything that I tried that didn't work out was an experience that I've been able to use for something else. 
as a nurse practitioner or any ATRN, I want you to know your worth um, if you make it uh, to a program and work with a preceptor. Um, please let them know, um, ask them for the opportunity to see their billing, to get familiar with RVUs. Um, as a nurse, you're used to being a call to an organization, but as an ATRN, you're a revenue generator. And so your relationship with the organization that you work with changes significantly. And sometimes as an ATRN, you're not used to that role. You've always been a nurse, and which is somewhat for lack of a better word, it's a subservient role. You don't think of yourself as having the same worth as other providers. Um, and But know that you're now the revenue generator. Nurse practitioners always pay for their salary, so to speak. Um, also, another thing is go to all the interviews. Even if you don't think you want to do it, go to the interviews. The experience is phenomenal. You'll see how other organizations treat people, and you don't know what you may or may not like until you interview for it. So go to all of the interviews. Um, one last thing I'm going to leave us with tonight. <laughs> I tell each student that I have, this is my saying, good outcomes are the result of experience and experience is the result of unexpected outcomes. It's a play on a Mark Twain quote um, that says good judgment is the result of experience and experience is the result of bad judgment. Now, no one wants to ever tell a student that. We don't want bad judgment. However, um, learn from those that are around you. If you're seriously considering being an APRN, listen to the mentors in your life. Have a conversation with an APRN that does something you may think you would want to do. Um, and learn from their experiences. Um, I have so much stuff that was instilled to me uh, from my preceptors and instructors. And I hope each student that I ever have, I touch their lives as well with some of the mistakes that I've made and some of the absolutes that I've taught them. And do we have any questions from um, from those that have dialed in? This is June Graf. Um, any regrets or things that you would do differently? Um, it seems like there's a consensus of putting it off, like uh, several you got to put off. Any other regrets or things you do differently? I might possibly would have done it a little slower because three years full time doing DUP, I didn't exactly know what I was getting myself into. Mm -hmm. So I would have probably done it part time because their, their range was like four years to seven. So you could just add one extra year. But I would have done it a little slower and been able to take more time with each part of it because it's a little bit more. All right. But in the end, it was fine. But in, in the looking back, <laughs> yeah. You know, I think everybody, like, I got my VSN sooner, but life would have, you know, may, things may have worked out different. Anyone else? If not, uh, thank everybody uh, who uh, dialed in tonight to listen. And for those of you that listen to this on the recording, if you want, you can reach out to each of us um, if you have specific questions. If you're interesting, uh, interested in shadowing uh, any of us, I'm sure each of us would give someone the opportunity. I know I want to go shadow Melanie. <laughs> Let's see what Melanie does all day. Um, but also, um, if welcome you to are in the APRN program soon, um, know that I think each, everyone, <laughs> I need a, a success story from there, I need to see. You need to be over there when you ring the bell. Um, I think each, everyone that spoke tonight would be willing to be a preceptor uh, if someone is looking at an APRN program. Um, and uh, we're all here to be supportive because if we have, we've all done it, and we all done it, and we all did it a different way. And um, so, start now, um, leaning on others. All right. Thank you, everybody who participated in the panel. Thank you. Hi, yeah. Alice. Hi, James. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.